The Snake Fiend by Farnsworth Wright Even as a child, Jack Creamy delighted in collecting reptiles, and he seemed to absorb much of their venomous nature. His best-loved pet was a large black snake, but when it caused him a whipping by crawling into his father's bedroom, he roasted it over a slow fire in a large pot, listening with glee to its agonized hissing and pushing it back with a stick when it strove to crawl out of the searing container. It was no cause for wonder, then, that his burning love for the girl of his dreams turned to fierce hate when she became the bride of another. Creamy's sentiment for Marjorie Bressy was aroused by her fine Italian beauty, which reminded him of his mother. He could have fallen in love with any other girl as easily if he had set his mind to it in the same way. By dint of comparing her with his mother's picture, he conceived a great admiration for her. Then he wished to possess her, to be her lord and master, to marry her. Gazing on her every day with this thought in his mind, his admiration grew to a burning passion. Of all this he said nothing to Marjorie, and then it was too late. Marjorie loved and was loved by Alan Jimerson, a young civil engineer. Creamy neither threatened nor cajoled. He simply accepted the fact and meditated revenge. He was all smiles at their wedding, and he gave them a wedding present beyond what he could reasonably afford, while he planned to tumble their happiness in ruins about their ears. After a short honeymoon, Jimerson departed with his wife to take up his duties as resident engineer of some construction work on the Western Railroad. Creamy, his face glowing with friendship and goodwill, was the last to clasp Marjorie's hand in farewell as the train pulled out of the station. "'Write to me often, Marjorie,' was his parting injunction. "'Send me a letter as soon as you get settled, and let me know how you are getting along.' I don't want to lose touch with either of you." And he meant it. Marjorie was fond of the handsome, manly-looking Italian youth, and liked him immensely as a friend, although she had never been in love with him. No sooner was she settled in her new home than she wrote him a long letter, telling of her husband's work, the bleakness of the desert country, and the strange newness of her life. She and her husband occupied a cabin together, apart from the bulk housing of the construction camp, in the sagebrush region of Northern California, not far from the Nevada border. A fierce joy and exultation leapt in Creamy's heart when he read Marjorie's letter. "'You would like this country better than I do,' she wrote, "'for it is infested with rattlesnakes. The bare desert rocks on the ridge four miles from our cabin are swarming with them. Ugh! They sun themselves in tangled masses, Alan says, but truly I can't bring myself to go near the place. I get quite too much of snakes without that, for we are constantly killing them in the sagebrush. This country has never been settled, and except for an occasional prospector, there was nobody to kill them before the surveyors came. The Indians never bothered the snakes but pass by them on the other side of a sagebrush and leave them in peace. Creamy scored these lines in red ink, word by word, as if to blazon them on his memory, and he drew little pictures of snakes on the margin. He burned out Marjorie's signature with acid, spitefully watching with minute care as the letters faded, and gleaning a savage satisfaction from seeing the paper rot away under the venomous bite of the poison. Then he fed the paper to the flames, as he had roasted the black snake years before, and watched the missive burn into black ashes, and crumble slowly away, page by page, into gray dust. Followed Creamy's pursuit of the pair, 
His arrival was not expected by either Jemison or Marjorie, but it was nonetheless welcome, for both of them liked the genial, companionable Italian. Life on the edge of the desert had few distractions at best. Creamy's eyes lit with genuine pleasure at the sight of his prospective victims. The joy on both sides was sincere. No, this isn't a pleasure trip, he explained to them, although I expect to have pleasure enough out of it before I get through. I have turned from collecting reptiles to studying their lives and habits. I intend to write a monograph on rattlesnakes. When I got your letter, Marjorie, I knew that I could do no better than to come here. I expect to become very well acquainted with that ridge you wrote about, where the snakes sun themselves in tangled masses. Marjorie shuddered, and Creamy laughed. Well, don't bring any of your snakes around here, she said. I turn cold and something grips at my insides every time I hear one rattle. Creamy built himself a small cabin about a mile from the Jimmersons, in the direction of the Rattlesnake Ridge. He adorned the shack tastefully, and Marjorie's deft hand gave it a distinctively feminine neatness and charm to its appearance. He became a frequent visitor at the Jimmersons' cabin, and evening after evening he read to them in his melodious, well-modulated voice. Sometimes the draftsman or transitman would come in, and Creamy would join in playing cards until late at night. He seemed to take pleasure in the company of Marjorie and her husband, and his face always lit up at the sight of them, especially when they were together. But it was the joy of a boy who sees the apples ripening for him on the neighbor's tree, and knows that they will soon be ready for him to pluck. He was almost happy when he was meditating his frightful revenge. As his preparations drew near their end, he often spent whole hours gloating over the fate in store for the couple. For Marjorie, in loving Jimerson, had aroused him to insane jealousy, and Jimerson, having robbed him of his heart's desire, was included in Creamy's fierce hate of the girl who had crossed him. Then one evening Marjorie and her husband happened in at Creamy's cabin. Marjorie expressed her horror at the thought of Creamy wandering among the snake-infested rocks of the Rattlesnake Ridge. The snake hunter seated her on a box that contained a twisting knot of the venomous reptile. Marjorie, serenely unaware, talked on blithely, and Creamy's merry laugh pealed out at regular intervals. He was in right jovial mood that evening, for he was ready to spring the death trap prepared for his two friends. He only awaited a favorable opportunity to strike. The opportunity came when the surveyor's cook, crazed by bad whiskey, smashed up the kitchen. Jimerson discharged him, and the cook muttered threats of a horrible vengeance. Shut up, Jimerson ordered. This is the third time you've been seeing snakes, and now you've wrecked the cook shack. You ought to be sent to jail, or a lunatic asylum. It's you that'll be seeing snakes, the cook spluttered. You and that Italian wife of yours'll see plenty of them, red and green and... Jimerson struck him across the mouth and sent him on his way. This was in the evening. The draftsman and the rodsman went to town the next day to hire a new cook, while Jimerson and Marjorie went on an outing at the headwaters of the Feather Creek. It was Sunday and they intended to spend the day together. Cromini declined their invitation to accompany them. It was the molting season, he explained, when the snakes were casting off their skins. He could ill afford to lose a day of observation at this time, for he had several perplexing points to clear up before writing his monograph. Cromini walked fearlessly from rock to rock of the rattlesnake ridge, chuckling to himself. The tangled mass of snakes, of which he had been told, existed only in rumor, although there were snakes in plenty if one looked for them. Tangled masses would serve his purpose later, but he had gathered them here and there, one or two at a time. By noon, 
the little cluster of cabins occupied by the engineers was deserted. Marjorie and her husband had gone since sunup, and the surveyors were all in town. Not a soul was stirring in the neighborhood of the shacks, and the men at the construction camp were mostly lying around in their bunks or playing cards. Cremaini nailed fast the windows of Jimerson's cabin. Then he entered and secured the bed to the floor so that it could not be moved. He laboriously carried his box of snakes a mile or more from his room to the little gully behind the surveyor's cabins and hid them in the sagebrush. Marjorie and her husband came back from their tramp after dark that evening, dog-tired. Marjorie cooked a little supper, and by ten o'clock the two were asleep. Cremini entered their cabin about midnight. They were fast in the chains of slumber, and he did not find it necessary to muffle his tread. He removed the chairs, shoes, clothes, and even the hand mirror and toilet articles. Everything that might serve as a weapon, no matter how slight, he took away. Then he brought his snakes from the gully and collected them in front of the cabin. When he had assembled them all, he knocked the top from the largest box, carried it into the room, and in the audacity of his certain triumph, he dumped the twisted mass of rattlesnakes on the bed where Marjorie and her husband lay asleep. The other boxes he emptied quickly just inside the door and withdrew, for he had no wish to set foot among the venomous serpents. Revenge is never satisfied if the retribution overtakes the avenger, and Cremini had no wish to share the fate of his victims. He locked the door from the outside and battened it. Then he removed the boxes that had contained the snakes and returned to his cabin and peacefully went to sleep. Marjorie awoke with the first rays of the sun and lazily opened her eyes. Her heart leapt suddenly into her throat and she was wide awake in an instant. A flat, squat head of a rattlesnake was creeping along her breast. Its beady eyes were fixed on her face, and its red tongue flicked before her like a forked flame. For a moment she thought she was still dreaming, but the familiar outlines of the room lined themselves in her consciousness, and she knew that what she saw was real. Her shriek rent the air as she threw back the bedclothes and sprang to the floor. She stepped on a coiled serpent, which sounded an ominous warning as it struck out blindly. She quickly climbed back on the bed and stood on the pillow, screaming. Her husband was beside her at once, hazily trying to understand the import of the hysterical torrent of words she was sobbing into his ears. For an instant he thought she must be in the clutch of some horrible nightmare. Then a quick, startled glance around the room turned his blood to ice. There was now a continuous rattling, as of dry leaves blowing against a stone wall, for Marjorie's screams had galvanized the snakes into activity. The room was filled with their angry din. It sounded in Jimerson's ears like the crack of doom. The floor seemed covered with the creeping reptiles. Some were coiled, the whirring tips of their tails making an indistinct blur as they rattled, and their heads swaying slowly back and forth. Others writhed along the floor, their venomous squat heads thrusting forward and withdrawing, and their tongues darting out like red flames. On the bed itself there was a motion underneath the thrown-back coverlet, and the ugly gray head of a thick, four-foot snake protruded from under it, the evil eyes shining dully, as if through a film of dust. It extricated itself and coiled as if to strike, while Marjorie shrank fearfully against the wall, wide-eyed with horror. Jimerson attacked the reptile with the pillow, sweeping it off the bed onto the floor. He quickly looked around him for a weapon, and saw at once that he was trapped. There was not even a shoe or a pincushion with which to fight the crawling, rattling creatures. He tried to rock the bed toward the window as boys moved sawhorses forward while sitting on them, but the bed was firmly fastened to the floor 
and in his efforts to release it he was bitten on the wrist by the strike of a large snake coiled near the foot of the bed jimerson flung the reptile across the room and sprang to the floor with an oath crushing a large rattler with his heel as he jumped he raced to the door and wrestled with it for a full minute before he discovered that he and marjorie were locked in that serpent hole he sprang to the window and felt a sharp stab of pain in the flesh of his calf as the open jaws of another reptile found their mark and the poison fangs were embedded deep in the flesh the window like the door was nailed fast but he broke out the glass with his bare fists unmindful of the blood on his lacerated hands he was back at the bedside treading over reptiles with his bare feet marjorie lay on the bed unconscious he lifted her in his bleeding arms and hurled her through the window to safety he struggled out after her tearing open his bitten leg on the jagged pieces of glass still left in the window frame the spurting blood drenched him and he leaned faint and dizzy against the cabin as three of his surveyors came running up having been attracted by marjorie's screams in almost incoherent words he told them what had happened he asked them to make immediate search for the discharged cook for there was no doubt in jimerson's mind that it was the cook who had placed the snakes in the room then the sky went suddenly black before his eyes and he lost consciousness at that minute cremini was waking from a peaceful dream he recalled what he had done the night before and blissfully mused on what must be taking place in the jimerson cabin a phantasmagorical succession of pictures weltered in his mind marjorie and her husband fighting with bare hands against the serpents bitten a score of times by the angry fangs of the rattlesnakes clinging to each other in terror sinking to the floor in agony as the poison swelled their tortured limbs and overcame them lying green and blue in death with rattlesnakes crawling and hissing over their dead bodies it is remarkable how few people die from rattlesnake bites even when as badly bitten as jimerson was probably not one adult victim in a hundred succumbs to the venom although mistaken popular belief considers rattlesnake poison as fatal as the death potion of the borgias jimerson had known too many cases of snake bite to believe his case hopeless he did not give up and die nor did he try to poison his system with whiskey he knew that this condition was serious but he let rest and permanganate of potash rubbed into his wounds affect a cure the bleeding from the lacerated leg had almost entirely washed out the poison and there was little swelling the pain in his swollen wrist however distended almost to bursting kept him from sleeping and the sickly green hue of the bite distressed him but it did not kill him creamy careful observer of reptiles though he was had never known an actual case of snake bite and he shared the popular illusion that the bite of the rattlesnake dooms its victims to death hence he was certain of the complete success of his revenge and his gloating glee was unclouded by even the shadow of a doubt that marjorie and her husband had been killed in his death trap he awaited only the supreme joy of drinking in the details of his success to feel the exultant thrill of complete victory as creamy sat alone two days after the horrible morning jimerson was limping slowly toward his cabin his swollen hand still pained him badly and there was a dull ache in his ankle when he put too much weight on it but he thought the fresh air would benefit him supporting himself with a cane and leaning heavily on marjorie at times he went painfully toward the young italian's deserted home not once had his suspicions pointed toward creamy as the author of the crime for the guilt of the lunatic cook seemed all too clear besides he liked creamy for his genial camaraderie his joviality and good humor 
and his frank interest in everything that concerned either him or marjorie so intent was the snake fiend on passing the torments of his victims before his fancy that he did not hear the knock on his cabin door his brain was too busy to heed the message sent by his ears for he was feasting on the mental and physical tortures that jimerson and marjorie must have endured before they lay cold in death on the floor of the cabin hideously discolored by the venom of the rattlesnakes by degrees he became conscious that he was not alone two persons stood before him and he raised a vengeful spirit on the story he had been waiting two days to hear even when he gazed at those whom he had consigned to a horrible death the thought that they were alive did not permeate his consciousness the idea of failure had never entered his mind for even an instant they were dead beyond the peradventure of a doubt, and now their avenging ghosts stood before him. Crimmy dropped to his knees in white terror and crawled behind his chair. He clasped and unclasped his hands in agony of fear. Sweat poured from his face and bathed his body. He implored mercy. He screamed for forgiveness. He gibbered like a frightened ape half-forgotten words in italian learned from his mother's knee fell from his lips he pleaded and begged for his life crawling on his face toward the amazed couple in an endeavor to clasp their knees as the meaning of his broken ejaculations was borne in on them a tremendous loathing and disgust overcame them marjorie clung to her husband unnerved at the repulsive sight of the malicious coward groveling on the floor and trying to kiss their feet cremini shrieked and gnawed his hands as he saw the avenging angels of his victims leave the cabin it was impossible for the stern hand of the law to inflict greater punishment on jack cremini than his own malice had wrought for him today he occupies a padded cell in a hospital for the incurably insane the end of The Snake Fiend by Farnsworth Wright